there were, um, I think close to 47 um, people who registered, so. Wow. Um, it might take a few minutes. Just like a typical thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you up here or are you down in Texas? I'm I'm here. I'm actually I'm actually in my office right now because um, I'm going to be using doing multiple applications at once and my home internet isn't good enough. But okay. yes, I thought about briefly going home. Um, my sister was sick at one point um, and I almost went home in emergency, but then she got better. Um, and, uh, and then at the point when I thought, well, maybe I could go and visit, it started surging down there. So, yeah, I think um, it's not to go. Yeah. Not now, anyway, maybe later. Yeah. Gonna have to wait. It's just safest to. Yep. Hi, Aviva. So nice to see people, right? It is. Yeah. You look great. <laughs> it must be that summer relaxation we're all getting. <laughs> right. <laughs> How many meetings a day on average, Aviva? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not bored. <laughs> I'm sure none of you are. <laughs> You're not looking for recipes to try out to pass the time. <laughs> That's the last thing I would be looking for. <laughs> wow, lots of people. Nice. Yes. Whoops. Terry, do you want to give people till what, 204? Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Are there a lot of people in the building, Carrie? No. No? No, it's, it's quite empty here. Um, when I got here um, at first, I was setting up and um, getting ready, and all of the internet went down for five minutes, and I almost had a heart attack. Um, <laughs> Because there's nobody here to say, what's happening? Right. Um, but it, it came back, so. But it's very quiet. Best parking I've ever got. <laughs> I see you stay here, too.
I think we can start, right? We have how many people? 41 people. Wow. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you to all the faculty who are attending this meeting. It's July 15th and you are here. So enough said, right? Um, but really it speaks volumes about the commitment that people have shown to their teaching, to their students. Um, I hope that you're finding time to relax as well, but really thank you so much for being here. And I also wanted to thank Dr. Carrie Monzo, who agreed without any arm twisting to teach <laughs> us today and next Wednesday. Carrie is beginning his second year as visiting assistant professor of literature, and we are incredibly lucky to have him. He created and teaches, and teaches classes, um, including literature of race and human rights, decolonizing sex and gender, animals and the environment in global literature, and child soldier narratives. And as just the titles show you how much his presence has enhanced and diversified not only the literature curriculum, but the college's curriculum across the board. Harry has experience teaching online courses, and this, it's this experience that he will draw on today to teach us a bit more how to use VoiceThread in remote classes. So Carrie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you again. And thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. This is um, quite a large group. So um, because of that, uh, because of the size of the group and because of um, the material, this today is gonna be a little bit more instructive and less interactive. Um, and next week it'll be more interactive, I promise. Um, but I'm going to lead you through um, the, this, a particular system of using VoiceThread that I figured out was the easiest and best way for me to navigate um, last spring as we were all you know, in a rush to move to online. Um, and so it's geared towards being very easy for you to onboard your classes, hopefully. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll work with students in, in terms of the flexibility of time, place, um, and access to bandwidth, which uh, can be a major issue. Um, so uh, to start out, um, have, has, I, has, if you, how many of you have used uh, VoiceThread already? If you, um, in the poll, you can raise your hand or use the poll and say yes. So from just the screen I'm seeing about a good, maybe a third of people have used uh, VoiceThread. So VoiceThread is not my favorite app in the world, um, but, uh, but we can make it work for us. And, and so um, that's my focus today. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen to get us started. Oops. And I'm going to Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? I love Lego. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I thought the 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 face was was pretty um, accurate uh, for for our feelings uh, here as well. Um, Okay, so today we're going to talk about using VoiceThread for asynchronous interactive lectures, and those two points are really important. And so asynchronous is, um, is, is really here meant to be uh, that, that we're not tied to a time and place um, or to any kind of live content. Um, so we're, going to, we're not going to learn all of VoiceThread because there are a lot of different applications, a lot of possibilities for using VoiceThread. We're just gonna focus on those things that, um, that will allow us to get the most out of it from, from my experience. So um, I wanna start outside of VoiceThread with a, a software that I think most of us are very familiar with, which is PowerPoint. Um, so we're going to start outside and, and learn how to create narrated um, lectures within PowerPoint that are easy to upload into VoiceThread. And then I'm going to go through the process of how to set up the VoiceThread assignments uh, using the Moodle plugin. Um, the thing that uh, is, so I, I like using the PowerPoint because of the familiarity and um, 
another point in favor of VoiceThread is that it works really well with the Moodle plugin so that when you create your VoiceThread, the, um, it's already tied to your gradebook and it's already in a location that students are familiar with and, and able to access really well as well. Can you all hear me all right? Am I coming through? Okay, good. Um, and then I want to show, talk about how to manage and moderate as well as grade the VoiceThread. And I'm going to show you an example from one of my classes of a VoiceThread that students uh, worked with. And then lastly, I'll get to the, the main pitfalls and shortcomings of VoiceThread to be aware of, um, and the ones that I really stumbled on as I was trying to get, um, get things going with my own classes. Um, so, um, so let's get started. So, so, um, so why VoiceThread? Um, so VoiceThread allowed me to easily convert my existing PowerPoint slides to a, a virtual and cloud-based format. Um, I generally, when I do lectures, I use PowerPoints because students like having the text, the bulleted text, um, and visuals, and also it keeps me on track, um, and I don't digress. Uh, so I already had the power uh, of PowerPoints existing, um, and, and VoiceThread worked with that very well. The other two competing apps or plugins that I considered uh, were the, um, the Moodle lesson format, and this is a typo, um, and the H5P. Um, so the Moodle lesson, I don't, I don't know if you've used it before. Uh, it allows you to do text and some video. Um, it's very bulky. It's very difficult to navigate for somebody who's creating, um, who's creating content, right? So from the instructor end, it's very bulky. From the student end, it's great. Um, and and the Moodle lesson is also. Um, it, it required converting a lot of my um, lecture into text, flat out text, like textbook. It does, doesn't allow narration in a very usable way. So Moodle lesson, that was gonna be a lot of work and I tossed that one out, no. Um, then the other one was the H5P program, which Keith did a training on um, last week or week before last, which is an amazing platform and has a lot of great things that you can do with it. And he showed us just a little bit of that as well. Um, but again, so H5P in, is largely video based. And so in order to use that, what I was going to have to do was create videos of my lectures and then upload the videos and then do all of the stuff from there. So again, there was going to be a lot of extra work involved with that that frankly I just didn't have the time to do. I really want to, you know, I like those, I like Moodle Lesson, I like H5P, but um, I simply didn't have time to convert everything to those platforms because they, they, they require so much labor. Um, so, so Moodle Lesson, H5P I checked, and then VoiceThread was the, the other option, and VoiceThread gave me that familiarity and that easy transfer uh, from PowerPoint to a VoiceThread that I really liked. Um, I also really like VoiceThread because it allows asynchronous threaded discussion of the lecture, which is very much like a social media um, platform that students, but it's a, it's a way of interacting that students are very familiar with and comfortable with. Um, it allows threaded discussion via text, via voice, and via video. And that's from either instructors or students. So there's a lot of options there. Um, another important thing about VoiceThread is that it worked with low bandwidth. So if students don't have high speed internet, and especially if they're working off of a hotspot, um, and many of them are, so they're, they're taking their phones and turning their phones into hotspots, or they're doing all of their work on their phone even, um, VoiceThread works with that. In fact, there's a phone-based app that students can download for VoiceThread. Um, 
and they can and they they can work with the lectures that way. So so they don't really need need high speed internet like they might need with more uh, video rich uh, platforms. Um, it's also good if you have low bandwidth on the instructor end too, or your internet is a little um, uh, can can be bad at times. Uh, it's easier for instructors to work around that as well. Um, so so it has that. Um, and then lastly, what I decided last semester after I surveyed my students was that I wanted to go to a, um, a hybrid synchronous and asynchronous design because students felt that that would be more uh, flexible for them uh, during the pandemic. A lot of them had to pick up extra shifts at work or were taking care of parents or so, so having the combination of some synchronous activity and some asynchronous activity um, was most flexible. And so if I'm going to do that kind of combination, what I wanna do is take the part of my teaching that is most me involved, right? The lecture part and make that the asynchronous portion. Um, and then the part that's more of of student led and us all engaging together, that's the part I wanna be live and synchronous. Um, so, so taking my lectures and making those virtual and asynchronous, that was the easiest for me and made it more flexible for students. And there's, so, so there's a value to asynchronous learning and asynchronous lectures. Um, it's flexible in terms of time and place. You know, if a student has to go somewhere to find public Wi-Fi, they can do that, and they can do that at a time when maybe they don't have childcare or responsibilities or they don't have work. So it's got that flexibility. Um, asynchronous lectures, when done right can better enable students to pause and reflect on the content that they're absorbing. And for students who in a traditional classroom struggle to um, put their thoughts into words or to break in with a question that's on their mind, um, for those students who maybe need more time to pause and reflect before they can say, wait, I have a question, Asynchronous lecture gives them that opportunity. They can literally pause and the, the lecture and stop and think and reflect before responding or before jumping in. Or if they're confused or missed something, they can go back. So, um, so it gives them that control over the lecture and the learning from the lecture. Um, and the other thing about the value of asynchronous lectures is that for the instructor, it frees you from monitoring students for attention and uh, monitoring uh, questions in the chat and all the other hundred things that could be happening at once. Because you know, if your mind is on trying to deliver content, it's hard to also monitor all of those other things. So it gives us that advantage. So, I, I heard from, um, you know, when we were talking to, as, as group, in our various groups, in our department, about the move to, um, to the uh, um, uh, online format, there was, there were a lot, number of people who said that they didn't really feel maybe comfortable with going to asynchronous lecture or they expressed that they felt that students wanted the synchronous experience um, in order to feel still connected to the class. Um, and I think some of that is based on some, you know, the, the fact that asynchronous in lecture or asynchronous instruction kind of gets a bad rap. But asynchronous lecture doesn't have to be one-sided. I mean, I don't know if you all do a lot of social media, but there was this image uh, that went around in the spring of this professor who 
um, wasn't comfortable with te technology. And so rather than um, lecturing via Zoom, he started recording his lectures in his lecture hall, but he had a, you know, a Pinocchio there um, to serve for the student body, um, uh, which is, then it, that kind of became a joke because of the, 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 you know, the idea that you have this unresponsive puppet as your, as your um, audience. But um, we all did what we had to do. But so it doesn't have to be one-sided. We don't have to feel like um, an asynchronous lecture is just the instructor, just the professor uh, speaking into a recorder or recording a video and posting that up and then just going away. It can be interactive. It can invite students to think and comment on the material. And it, it doesn't have to be boring. I mean, it doesn't have to be a laser light show either, but it can be stimulating and it can um, it, encourage students to engage in, in multiple ways. Asynchronous lecture also doesn't have to be a single modality. It doesn't, I'm going to show you, you can add different kinds of media into VoiceThread. Um, it, it doesn't have to be just video. It doesn't have to be just a, a set of PowerPoint slides. Um, and lastly, it doesn't have to be a technical production. Um, you, you don't have to buy a whole bunch of video recording equipment or borrow it from the, uh, the school here in order to create fabulous videos that will keep students engaged. Um, we can do this with just the tools we have at hand and often with the tools that are already familiar to us. So yay, asynchronous lecture. Um, another thing I want to point out is that there's been a lot of talk, um, and there's an article in Inside Higher Ed about this, which um, I can send around. Um, but the, uh, the, you know, students, maybe in the spring they did say that um, in the move to synchronous, in the move to online education, the synchronous contact point, the live class, via Zoom felt good, it felt reassuring, it was something that they were happy to have. Um, because they were in a crisis moment, because they were experiencing a lot of trauma and having something familiar was stabilizing to them. And, and that was great. But what we expect as we move into another semester of being online, students are not experiencing that intense crisis in the same way, right? We're, we're extended, experiencing extended crisis and extended trauma, but, um, but students, we expect that students are going to start to want more flexibility. So they're not going to be leaning on familiarity with the, the similarity to face-to-face. -to -face. They're going to be wanting more flexibility in how content is being delivered and how they can interact with it. And so creating this synchronous, asynchronous options will open that up for them. So as I said, I, I did this last semester. Uh, I got a lot of positive student feedback from it. Um, in our course evaluations, the um, student feedback um, was that these, whoops. Hang on just a second, I lost that. Sorry. Um, so, so in the um, student feedback, uh, one of the comments was that the voice thread lecture um, was one of the most valuable elements of the course. Um, the other thing that students said that they really liked was the um, uh, uh, the discussion that we that we were able to have in class and how they moved from the face to face class to the virtual class. So next week when I'm uh, talking about shared inquiry, that's, the other, that's what I'm going to be talking about. But the students liked the voice threads. They felt they were very valuable. They appreciated the combination of the slides and narration. Um, and they liked the ability to review lectures when they were preparing their papers. 
So, um, so this was good. So they, 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 liked the, they liked live classes, but they also liked the flexibility that they got from VoiceThread. So what is VoiceThread? Um, VoiceThread is, it's a collaborative presentation tool. It's sort of like PowerPoint in the cloud, um, but in addition to your regular features that you're familiar with, with a PowerPoint, um, it also allows for interaction, for asynchronous threaded discussion of different kinds of media. Um, VoiceThread is, voice is cloud-based, so there's no software involved. Students don't have to download um, a particular kind of software. Um, and it's easily accessed via Moodle. So the next thing I'm going to do uh, for just a, in just a moment is um, talk about um, how to create the PowerPoint, how to create the narrated uh, voice thread lectures from PowerPoint. Um, but before I do that, I want to pause right here and see um, if you have uh, questions about um, so far, just about my rationale for why VoiceThread. All right, I've sold it so far. I'm not getting paid by VoiceThread to do it, to sell it. But okay. All right. So. Come on. Okay, so so let's talk about how to create narrated voice thread lectures from your PowerPoints. So I'm going to um, be um, assuming that you already have some created PowerPoints, but for your lectures. But um, if you if you don't, then the first step is just going to be to create some PowerPoint uh, lectures. Now there are two methods that we're, we can use to create narrated uh, presentations um, in VoiceThread. And uh, I'm gonna go over the first one uh, here showing you this PowerPoint. And then the second one I'm going to show you using VoiceThread itself. Um, the main difference in these two options is how you record the narration. So that's, that's the big difference in the two, two methods, is how you record the narration. Okay, so how do we get started? We create a PowerPoint, and you can create a PowerPoint using um, what you already have or open an existing PowerPoint and just do a basic PowerPoint design. Don't get fancy with animation. Um, I like using animation when I'm doing a live lecture so that my words will appear or float up or things are flying in and flying out. But when we convert our PowerPoint slides to Moodle, it's going to get rid of all of those. So just make, you wanna keep it very basic. So no animation. Use standard fonts when you're creating your PowerPoint. Um, so, uh, you know, you want to have um, your your usual set of um, you know your familiar fonts up here. If you've downloaded any fancy fonts that you use in some other application, um, don't try using those because uh, it will when you when you transfer this to Moodle or to VoiceThread, uh, those fonts will get messed up a bit. So just use standard fonts. Do a basic presentation. You can add images, those are great. The images will, should mostly be fine, um, but, but otherwise it's, it's just kind of a basic setup. Um, now, once you've created your presentation um, and you, you've opened it, sort of let's say that what we have here is the presentation that I'm 
going to put into VoiceThread. Then you're going to create your narration. There are two ways of creating narration in PowerPoint. One way is to come to the slideshow feature up here at the top menu, and then to record the slideshow here. We don't want to do that. We do not want to do that for this purpose. So, um, so that's the first way, don't do it that way. Instead, what we want to do is go to insert, and then over here, we want to go to audio, and we want to record audio. And you'll have to do this for each slide. Um, but that's okay, because when you're recording for each slide, if you mess up, it's easier to fix. Um, if you try and record via the slideshow feature, it, it, if you make a mistake, you're, you're more uh, wedded to it. So we just want to record your audio in one chunk for each slide. So usually, I name these little audio bites. Uh, something that um, I'll recognize. I usually name them based on the title of the slide. And then when I'm ready to go, I just click record and you talk through the content of the slide, the narration of the slide. Um, when you're done, just stop and then OK. And it's going to plant this little. Um, speaker icon right there in the center, and that's your recorded audio. So if you're not sure, you can play it back. Whoops. Okay. So so it's got so so you recorded this. Um, there's not a whole lot of editing options for these, so you kind of got to get them the, the chunk right. Um, but then you, the, the one way you can edit them is let's say that um, there was a lot of empty air at the end when I was thinking. I can use the trim audio or maybe at the beginning and I can trim this down to what I want from it. So you can do that bit. Um, the other good thing about recording the audio for each slide and not trying to use the, um, the slideshow feature is that as you're recording for your students, you can have this notes feature open here at the bottom. And you can use that as your um, as you're recording your audio. Oh, there we go. Ooh, nice use of GarageBand. Yeah, okay, so I'll go over that one more time. Is to record the audio, you're just going to go to insert and then all the way along here to audio where the media is and then click that and record audio. You can only do one audio clip per slide. So, you know, again, a downside to that. So there, and there are other ways to do the audio and um, which is sort of what we'll see in, in method two, but this is one uh, very simple way to do it just using uh, the, the PowerPoint features um, that you're familiar with. Um, the additional, um, so, so 
one of the good things about recording your audio uh, this way is, uh, well, actually, hold on to that. When I get to method two, I'll tell you why I don't like method two um, and, and why I feel like this one is a little bit better. Okay. Okay, so once you've created your narrated presentation, you're just gonna go and save that as normal, or save. And then you can come over to your Moodle course. And this is where you're going to add the voice thread activity. Um, you might have just a topic up here that's all voice threads. Uh, and you'll put all your voice threads under one topic or however you, you organize your course. So, so wherever you wanna put your voice thread, you're just going to turn the editing on as you would to add any, any of the plugins and then add an activity or resource. And add the voice, just click on the voice thread um, and add it there. So here you'll give it a name. And then there are a couple of things that you want to set, a couple of options you want to set. Um, so under that, I don't know if you saw that. So in the general tab here, where it says show more, we can just click on that and that will allow you to add an activity description. This is where I put um, the due date because uh, um, so this will show up uh, right next to the link for the, the lecture itself. So I put the due date, um, usually I put time because you know, if you don't put the time, um, so they'll say, but I, okay, so uh, put the time. Um, and then I'll also put the requirements for, uh, for successful completion of the assignment here. Oops. And then you want that to display on your course page so that, um, and we'll see it in a moment, so that when they're looking at the link, they're also looking at when it's due and what the requirements are. So you wanna set that and then you can come down here and the next important thing to set is the grade. So VoiceThread will, uh, so Moodle will pull the VoiceThread, the grade from VoiceThread or VoiceThread will push it into Moodle, however we wanna think about that. So, um, so you can set whatever grade value you want the assignment to have um, in this block here. So you can set it for point or scale um, and then put the, uh, the, the point number or the scale. Um, one thing to note is that VoiceThread's gr internal grading system is all percentage based. Um, so if you, I always said, uh, I had this set for 10 points. Um, in Moodle, it's going to be based on 100% uh, scale. Uh, sorry, not Moodle, in VoiceThread. Um, so you can't change that. You have to grade in percentages in VoiceThread itself. But you can decide here how that will be pulled into Moodle. Um, and then you can categorize, if you have grade categories, you can put them there. Um, you can also put, um, no, I think those were the important ones. Okay, so then we save that and we wanna return to the course. And you'll see the link is here, the title of the lecture, um, because the title, whatever the title of the lecture is here will match at it, as it's listed in my syllabus and my schedule. So the title here and then the requirements are uh, visible right underneath. 
Once you've done that and you click, you're going to be given a, a couple of options the first time you click the link. So there are these first four options of the first four, this one, this one, and this one are just options for, for displaying um, particular views. So, but right now the one, what we're interested in is this here, the assignment builder. So we can ignore the other three right now. Um, so we want to we want to click on assignment builder, and then again we're going to be given a few options. We can create a voice thread, or sorry, this is important. We want so so these three are the type of assignment we want to create. Uh, the type of assignment we want to create. And that's important because do we want an assignment that asks students to create a voice thread? That's the first option. Or an assignment that asks students to submit a comment or an assignment that asks students to watch a voice thread. So in the first one, they would create their own voice thread. In the second one, they submit a comment or comments on an existing voice thread. And in the third one, they just watch a voice thread and that's it. Well, that's not it. They watch a voice thread, they get credit for watching the voice thread. Um, the one we want is the middle, submit a comment. So we're gonna click on that. So one of my things about, um, voice thread i want to say right now is that that i don't like we can talk about this more at the end too is that i don't think that the buttons are all very um well labeled or intuitively lab labeled so okay so once we've said we want to create a voice thread we uh, or create an assignment for students to comment on a voice thread we're going to get this and we need to either select an existing voice thread these are ones I made last year, last spring, or create a new one. We're going to create a new one. All right, so this is the really exciting part um, that makes me really love VoiceThread, even though I really dislike so many things that VoiceThread does, is I've created my PowerPoint, I added, I recorded my narration on those PowerPoint lectures, Sorry, on those PowerPoint slides. Now I want to add media. So I'm just going to go to the window, go to wherever you have that file saved on your local computer drive. Here it is for mine. And it's just drag and drop. Oops. So when you drag and drop it, it's going to prompt you to. Um, to title it while it's going to think, and while it's thinking, you can um, title it. You can add your description here, and I just, um, I should have copied and pasted it from the other screen, but, um, but I just put the same thing that I put on the Moodle page because redundancy is important for students. Um, because they don't, uh, um, they, they're seeing so much text, um, this, this redundancy helps. Um, so requirements for successfully completing the assignment. And then you can tag it too. If you have a whole bunch of voice threads, the tag really is what helps um, organize. Um, your recordings. So you can do the title and description here. And then you want to set, while you have this open, you want to set the playback options. Um, there's a lot of things here. I'll try and go through them. Um, the first is, do you want to enable threaded commenting? So threaded means that students can comment on other students' comments, right? So they can create threads of discussion. So yeah, we want that because 
that's what they do with social media. That's the way they, they engage with media online regularly. So let's just, let's just build on that. So yeah, let's enable threaded commenting. Do you want to allow commenters to add slides to the voice thread? You can select that or not select it. It's up to you. Um, my students were interested in being able to add um, media they found in other locations like memes that spoke to um, the, the content of the lecture. And so they might like to just drop an image of a meme, uh, of a meme in. Um, so, so I left that available. Um, do you want to allow others to download original media? Um, I don't select this just because of copyright issues. Um, you can also allow others to export. I don't, um, I don't allow that. Um, start play when opened, I just leave that. Um, allow others to make a copy so they would be able to copy this into their own VoiceThread account. Um, that's up to you as well. Here's the other big um, one. This here, enable comment moderation. If you click that, that means that when a student posts a comment, it will be um, a hidden comment uh, until you, as the instructor, go in and make it visible. Um, so why so why is uh what is the purpose of that well it might be that you want to check comprehension at a particular point in your lecture so you ask a comprehension question and students are supposed to post a comment that um, reflects their comprehension at that point um, well if you do that you're asking for comprehension you don't want other students to automatically be able to see other students' comments, right? Because, you know, then, then they just go look at what somebody else said. They don't have to actually um, uh, demonstrate their own comprehension. So, so if you enable comment moderation, it allows you to keep those comments hidden. And then you can go back maybe 24 hours later and you can um, make those comments visible. Uh, the downside of this is that, as far as I can tell, you have to do this for every single, sorry, if you enable comment moderation and you later want to make those visible, you have to do it for each individual comment, um, which is time consuming. Uh, the other bad thing is you can't say, um, if you select enable comment moderation, that applies for all of the comments in the voice thread. So if you have one that is checking comprehension and another that's asking for discussion, all of them will be hidden equally. Um, and so you have to, you'd have to go back and make all of the um, discussion answers visible one at a time to allow students to interact with those. So um, that's very complex. I don't know if that was totally understandable. I'll try and show you an example. But for now, I will say that um, I tried using this, but my preference now is to not use it. Um, and instead of trying to ask comprehension questions, um, I, I instead uh, go with discussion questions. So students aren't just demonstrating comprehension, they're engaging with uh, each other for discussion purposes. Um, okay, so that was a lot about this uh, feature, but this, that's, it's a really important feature um, that has a lot of consequences for how students can use the voice thread. Um, okay, so the others are not real. I haven't found them to be important. Automatically advance the slide. No, you don't want it to do that. Um, don't allow commenters to delete their own comments. Um, I don't. Uh, I I would. I don't want to take that option away from them. Sometimes people make mistakes. 
um, limit each comment. So if you're going to ask students for audio comments, you'll want that. Um, and then uh, when recording, go to next slide and every so-and-so, and no, you don't want that. Okay, so you have all of those options. If you are going to use the same setup over and over again, then the first time you do this, you can just click save as default and then save. So by the time you've done all of that, your slides are all updated or all uploaded. And um, if you recorded narration on each slide, the narration will be there. So, um, so for the purposes of example, we just did uh, narration on this slide, which I'll show you in a moment. Okay, um, so our slides are uploaded. The, the next part is going, I'm, I'm going to kind of diverge and it might get a little confusing. So let me pause there. Um, and do you have any questions at this point? Let me scroll kind of back. I don't have a question yet, Carrie, because I'm assuming at some point, it, well, may, maybe not, I don't know. Do you have any plans to show us? I'd like to see some student threaded comments because not having used this, I would just love to see what those look like. If you have an example at some point that you could share, that'd be fantastic. If not, it's fine too. Yes, um, I am going to show, uh, show an example uh, of that. Um, yes, and you can see how the students interacted with it. Um, and then I have a question in the, um, in the chat, a, a work around that comprehension and discussion. Could it possibly be um, setting up a voice thread that requires splitting it into two and having part one of the voice thread being comprehension questions and part two being discussion? Yeah, that would be a great, that would be a workaround. Um, so, so you could do that. You'd, so you'd have um, two voice threads for one lecture and that would help with that, that issue. Okay, so let's go back to. Okay, so as, as I said, there's, there are two ways to do the narration. And that first way, that first method of doing narration is, is recording it right here in the, the PowerPoint. Um, the second way to do that oops, is to record it um, here in the voice thread itself. So, um, so the way you're going to do that, if you need to add narration now, is you're going to select option number two, um, with uh, the, the comment here. So we've added our media and we're going comment. Now, um, uh, if you went with method number one, if you recorded all of your narration in uh, PowerPoint, and then you uploaded it, you can go right to uh, right to step three, create assignment. Um, but if not, you've got to record it uh, here, so uh, via two. Um, oh, I, I do want to show you that if you did record narration um, in, uh, in PowerPoint, this is what it'll look like when it uploads and your narration will already be there, it's thinking. Okay, um, so, but if I did not record on, um, on PowerPoint, then I've got to record narration on each single, um, whoops, each single slide here. Um, and the way you're going to do that is there's this plus button here uh, for commenting in the little word, word bubble. And you'll collect that, or con sorry, you'll click that. And then you have several options for how you can add 
your narration um, or how you can add comments. The first one is a text-based. So if I, I click here, I can type, type out a comment, um, uh, which is, I mean, this is great for students, but um, I, for uh, recording the lecture itself, I, I don't like this one. Um, you can submit, you can make a comment on your phone and you can upload it um, that way. Um, if so, that's like if you can't record on your computer and upload via your computer, you could do it that way. Um, you can use just this button here to record an audio comment so students will um, hear your voice but not see your picture. Uh, and here you could record a video so students will see your face and they'll hear your voice. Um, I use one of these two and I tend to lean on. Um, the this one just recording audio um, most. So it's very easy. You just click record audio. It'll give you a little countdown right here, and then it's re uh, will be recording. Um, and you can talk through your lecture points um, for each slide. You can. Uh, when you're when you're done, when you recorded what you want, then you just click stop recording, and um, and it'll it'll um, it'll it will upload in uh, the the comment right then, and it'll start playing it back so you can hear it. Uh, if you decide at that point like oh I need to add a little bit more, I forgot to say, you can um, click before you, before you save, you can click. Uh, record more right at the end there. And then when you're ready, you can again uh, stop recording. And you can do that, record more and then stop. You can do that as many times as you want and it'll keep adding the recording to the end of the clip, not in the middle, but at the end. Um, while you're recording, so one of the advantages of, of recording the narration in the voice thread itself is that you can use these little um, pencils here to, um, to mark on your lecture, to doodle, and give this guy a mustache, whatever we need to do to make the point, to draw that Venn di diagrams. And it will draw those in. And if you have, if you, and if you have fade selected, then as you draw them and continue talking, those little doodles will, um, start disappearing. And then when you're done, you can push stop recording. And it will upload. I got a little message in the midst there that my connection was a little unstable. Um, and so I hope I didn't uh, cut out. Um, so, so at this point, once you've got all that saved or, or recorded, you can click save and your audio will be on this slide. Yes, so, um, oh. Okay, so I'm going to um, uh, uh, address Sarah and Kristen's uh, comments, um, uh, actually working backwards. So Kristen, yes, um, what you notice, so, so one of the things you'll notice as you're working with, um, with VoiceThread is that um, it has a tendency to get overloaded and boot you out in the middle of your recording, which is probably why um, 
it was um, uh, getting my connection was getting unstable as I was trying to record. So if 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 it's using too much bandwidth or whatever, it gets overloaded. It boots you out. And here's the really frustrating thing: is you will lose all of the audio that you've already recorded if it does that. Which is why. Um, exactly why I opted to record my audio in PowerPoint instead of trying to use VoiceThread here to record it. Um, so, yeah. Um, I don't know if there is a time limit to how much you can record. However, going back to Kristen's comment and what I was saying, um, if you overload it, the, the more my experience was that the more, um, the longer the, the comments you're trying to record, the more you risk getting booted out and, um, and losing, uh, um, losing that audio if you are live, if you are recording right into VoiceThread. But yeah, if you upload the audio um, from, uh, from PowerPoint or from GarageBand or from whatever, other um, uh, program you have for recording audio, uh, and you don't have that. You don't have that possibility of being um, booted out, or you don't risk being booted out. And if you're more skilled with GarageBand or or some of these other programs, you can do a lot more editing um, that of the audio. So for sure. Um, So as for, so Casey asking about some, um, uh, in some trainings on, on how to, uh, or some really getting to some really of the elementary issues and trainings or finding trainings. One of the positive things about VoiceThread is that they do seem to have a good um, set of instructional videos that are available via YouTube and are available on their website. So if you just Google VoiceThread, they have some good instructional videos. Um, the other good thing about VoiceThread or annoying, depending on how you look at it, is that once you start using it, you'll start getting emails saying, we're having a training today on this, we're having a training today on that. Um, and as we've been in this pandemic mo mode, moving to online instruction, they've been really steady about providing um, instruction uh, for for the the basic issues that people are facing, um, on that same issue, another good thing about VoiceThread, and again, and they're not paying me for this, um, uh, but a good thing about VoiceThread is they actually are responsive. So I had a question um, about grading, and uh, I sent that to their uh, their contact us email. They're open. They're 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 you know. Um, that information email box, and they replied within 24 hours um, and with a response. So, so there's that. Um, okay, so um, you can also, so I'll move, go forward a little bit because I saw a question um, related to this. So we can record all of our comments on each individual slide. Um, and then when you've recorded your full lecture, again, so VoiceThread, the, again, the buttons in VoiceThread are not intuitive. So when you're done creating and recording your lecture, you're going to click the X up here to close the editing mode. Um, Wait, so, where, where is that? Oh, I'll go back. So it's in the upper right hand corner here. It's this X. Oh, it's hidden by your picture because I have you in speaker mode. Got it, got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, so, so that confuses people a lot because you know, you're looking for a button that says done or submit or save or something like that, but that's not the button uh, that you need. The button you need is the close button. Um, so close that and everything you've done will be saved. Now, 
um, let's say, so, so we've got all of these PowerPoint slides in here, that's great, but let's say we want to add some video. Um, we can do that. Uh, we have some options. So this voice thread, you can add, um, you can add image, video, audio, you know, it's really, it's really versatile in that sense. Um, so if you want to add uh, media, you just click right here and you can add from, uh, from your computer, from um, cloud sources. You can uh, do an audio recording or a, a webcam photo uh, or video. Let me see, scroll down. Here's the one I'm looking for. Um, or you can um, add a URL, so a website address. So if there's, let's say there's a YouTube video um, on a subject that you want to incorporate into your lecture, uh, you can pull that YouTube video into VoiceThread. Um, so uh, the way to do that is just click on that last button down there for um, add media, and you'll get this pop-up. Um, and then go over to the video you want to add. Um, whoops, oh wait, I have to do this first, sorry. Hang on, okay. There we go. Um, so go to the video, the YouTube video, find the YouTube video you want to add. Um, then you're going to find, I just found this one on purchase college journalism to use as an example. So from here, find the share button here, and then just copy, there's a little copy button, just copy that. And then you can close and then go back to our voice thread and URL and we'll just paste control V that video link into uh, the, the bar here and save. And then it'll process that for a few minutes um, or seconds, depending on your, your um, how, what, I don't know, depending on the weather, the time of day, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. It'll process that video and add it to your lecture. And then you can move that around if you want, you know? It doesn't have to be at the end. You can start with that video. You know, or you can put that video after a question you have. Um, you know, you can put it wherever you want, and it'll show up in that order in the lecture when the students view it. Okay, so record your narration add your videos. Um, maybe you want to add a JPEG, an, an image file that you want students to discuss. You can also drop that in here. Um, the way the ad media works, so you can add it from your computer if you have an image file on your computer, um, or um, you can add the, the URL address of an image as well, and it'll upload it. So you can just drop, you know, have an image there so students can talk about that if you want. Um, yes, Sam. Samuel. Yes, thank Nobody's. you, Harry. Uh, the quick question is, um, the, so I asked the question about uploading a pre-recorded video, and the method you just showed through YouTube, does that necessitate the video being public or can you have it be a private video? Because I don't necessarily want to have, you know, videos of my lectures floating around YouTube, whether they're, you know, popularly known about or not still, you know. Right, yeah, good but, question. Thanks. So um, there are some limits. Uh, so so VoiceThread will, um, if there, if there, if the settings are not um, public use, Creative Commons, I'm licensed. I believed, I believe, um, it will. It might have trouble parsing that from YouTube into um, into VoiceThread. So if you have it set at a private setting, um, so it's not discoverable, it might have trouble. Um, 
I'm wondering though, if you have it set as a private video that can be viewed by people who have the link, right? So you, so you have those settings, then it should be okay. Um, the alternative is if you don't want to post to YouTube and you just want it to be on VoiceThread, don't use YouTube. So here for ad media, just add right from your computer. Right, so you can just upload directly to your computer and not have to host it on YouTube. If it's your, if it's your, um, your own uh, uh, works that you've created. Um, yeah, yeah, good question. Um, and, and there are going to be other cases, um, particularly, particularly around copyright, where VoiceThread will have a hard time um, importing the video into uh, your lecture. Um, so, uh, so be aware of that. Um, I'll show you, I was able to do a little bit of that and didn't have trouble, but but VoiceThread has, when you go to the page and look up information, it says, be aware this might not work if there are certain um, copyright restrictions on the work. So. so once you've added your media, you've got your narration, you're just going to create assignment. And here, again, redundancy. You know, in the description box, you know, uh, due date, requirements for completing. And at this point, you're going to um, tell the students and um, set the option on the assignment for how many comments students must submit in order to complete the assignment. So, because we, we want students to comment on this as well, right? So, um, so how many comments do you want um, or are you requiring students uh, to, um, to, to add? Um, you'll set that here. And that will be based on, you might have a certain number of questions um, in the lecture, or you might have a general requirement, just like you would for a discussion board, that students have to do um, so many comments and so many replies on other people's comments. So. Um, just set the number of comments that are required there. And then you're going to create the assignment. And once you've done that, it's going to take you um, back to your Moodle page. So when we click in again, so um, you know, I've, I've so I've I've created the assignment, I've posted it. Students um, went in, they viewed, they commented, um, and submitted, and then um, I need to go back and grade it. So when the next time I click on that assignment. It's going to take me to a different screen entirely. Um, what it will now take you to, instead of the create assignment screen, it's going to take you to the grading um, screen for that assignment. Um, so no students have um, replied on this voice thread, so um, so we don't um, so we don't see any any comments or or grades but uh, I'll lead you around it a little bit. Um, in the right hand um, uh, box over here, um, there's a submitted and a not submitted. So as students view the lecture, comment, um, finish the lecture, and click submit at the end of the assignment, um, their names will pop up here and there will be a little grading box right next to it, just like a grade, grade, uh, grading grade book, where you can enter their grade on a scale. You will be able to click on the student's name and VoiceThread will take you right to the student comment. 
um, comments because there should be multiple, right? Um, and so you can read each, look at their comments, and then you can give a grade uh, based on, on um, the value or, or how well those comments meet the requirements you've set out. There will also be names of students in the lower half who have not yet submitted the assignment. Um, and so um, there's the, the so, so the problem here, and this is one of um, uh, the pitfalls of this, is that um, if a student has not submitted the assignment, um, even if they've actually done the comments, if they don't click that submit button, the voice thread will not push the assignment through to you to grade. Um, so, problem. But, um, so, so, but on this screen, you'll be able to grade um, each, you know, all of the student sets of, of comments. Now, um, I want to show you what, um, this looks like in action. Not that one, not that one. Okay, so the other thing, I, voice thread is not easy to, um, um, navigate. Um, the, if you're ever, I'm gonna, let me, Voice thread. So, so if you want to see all of the voice threads that you've created, yeah. So I'm going to show you the student view in just a moment. So if you want to, if you want to see the voice threads that you've created, um, uh, you you can't go in easily through Moodle and find them. The easiest way is going to be to go to this link, um, which is your your own unique homepage within um, VoiceThread, and that will take you to to those. So this is what mine looks like. When I go to that, it's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking. Here we go. Okay, so these are the 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 voice threads that I've already created and that students have already um, commented on. And um, the classes, your classes are over here. It pulls the class names right from Moodle, so you don't have to set this up. It pulls your name and account from Moodle. You don't have to set that up. Um, it pulls the student names from Moodle, so they don't need to set that up. So um, it, it's all pretty well integrated. Um, so to see what a student, see what one of these looks like. This is one. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, so this was the um, voice thread I did last semester on uh, trans theory. And so we were talking about uh, transgender representation um, in, in media. And we're, uh, this was in my decolonizing sex and gender class. So, so this is the um, this title slide. And for each slide, you can see the audio is right here for uh, So you can hear my my voice, um, but I want to show you what it looks like for student interaction. So I asked a couple of students um, if I could show show you their work, uh, and and they agree. So students will show up along here. These are the individual comments that will show up. Each one is time stamped, date and time stamped, which is which is handy. Um, you know when the student made the comment. Um, it will give you the student name, and the student can um, go back themselves and um, and they can add a profile image, uh, which you you may or may not require. So, as students in in this class uh, were were listening to uh, or, or viewing the slides, they were just instructed to 
make, um, uh, uh, to submit three substantive comments um, on, on the slides. Let me see if I can find. Okay. So when you um, have the slide, or the student's name is here, you can click on this and it will open the comment box and you can see um, the text of the comment that the students made. I did not require students to, um, to do audio or video comments text comments were just fine and students opted uh, in general for text-based comments. Um, so the students will make comments. When a student uh, comments on a slide, you will get a uh, notification that a student has commented. Um, you are sort of, you're forced, you're forced subscription to it. So you'll get a, a notification. Um, and then you can go in and respond to those comments as well. And so some students will have longer comments um, and some students will have, have shorter. Um, the shorter ones didn't necessarily count for um, substantive um, interaction. Um, let me see if I can find. So the, um, the comments will show up, a, a, a rectangle will show, or square, sorry, will show up as a, an initial comment. The circles will be responded comments. So this is a student responding to this student. Um, and then you can reply in as well. And so, um, they can engage in, um, in discussion with one another. Um, and the student was very good at, at engaging in discussion um, around the content of the slides. And this is one, this last one is a, a video I pulled in from uh, YouTube. Which um, tied to our, our uh, discussion overall. So that's, um, you know, it's hard to show you exactly what this looks like uh, from a student perspective. This is one thing that, that VoiceThread is not good about doing is giving you that student perspective. Um, they have a lot of the same options. They're just kind of in different locations. So, but in general, some of the things that um, I, I learned from doing it is that um, for these student interactions, um, I wanted to require students that comments that either checked comprehension or engaged discussion. But as, as I mentioned before, you can't do both within one voice thread uh, because of that, um, that feature it doesn't have the flexibility. Um, there are, you can either ask students to sort of freestyle respond at any point, or you can have a slide that stops, has a question and asks students to respond there. In, in this class, um, I tended to have really good uh, student interaction. And so um, I let them um, go, um, All right, two, here we go. Um, so in that other class, I, I let them decide where they wanted to respond. I think in this one, okay. So in, in this particular class, um, these students were not as 
uh, motivated to, or, or perhaps they were more shy about engaging. So I made a point of leading with questions that were meant to engage the students in the lecture. So you um, so want to think about whether how you want to do that, um, or do you want some combination of the two? Um, do specify if you want a particular format. So if you want audio, you've got to let them know that you want audio. My experience is that they will they'll just want to uh, text. Um, and if you want video, specify that as well. But, but know that students will have the same kind of issues with upload and bandwidth associated with audio and video. Um, so, so that might be limiting for some students. Um, Definitely require students respond to each other and require that they do it a certain number of times. Um, because if not, they'll, you know, just as in, um, in other discussion formats, they'll try and just talk with um, the instructor and instead of with each other. Um, there is an option for students. I showed that really quickly. I'll show it again here. Uh, it looks a little different in the student menu, but it's in the same place. Um, I think it's in the same place. So in the menu, there's an option to subscribe to the voice thread. So you want to encourage students to do that. When they subscribe, that means that as other students make comments, they'll get an email notification um, so they know that there are comments that they can go and respond to. So let them know to, to subscribe. Um, and then lastly, um, really important, remind them that when they are done commenting, uh, viewing and commenting, and they are, are happy with their interaction with the voice thread, they need to go up, they need to at the end click that submit button. If they don't click the submit button, um, you can't grade it it won't let you grade it. Well, it will, but it's more difficult um, and there isn't an easy workaround. So they have to click that submit button. So, so that was, so, so, so pitfalls. Um, and we can talk, we're um, a little ahead, but that'll give us time. We can talk through things that um, if I missed anything, I'm sure I missed a ton, um, but uh, um, some of the pitfalls, I've mentioned a few of them, um, but I, I, these are things that when I say they're pitfalls, um, I really like, I can't stress this enough. First, this is the big thing, that submit button, students miss it. They don't click submit at the end. It's not because they didn't do the assignment. Um, you know, you saw that the comments are time stamped, right? So let's say that um, I'm entering grades and I notice that student uh, A, who is always really good at interacting and always really good about doing their work, didn't, didn't I, I don't have a grade for this one. Um, and I email them and say, hey, you didn't do the assignment. And they email me back and say, but I did do the assignment. I promise I did the assignment. And this is an actual conversations I had with students. Did you click the submit button? Then they go back and they click submit. Well, once they click submit, I can see that they made their original comment before the due date, right? Because it's date and time stamp. Um, and I know that the only thing they missed was just clicking that button. Um, but, but that's a problem. If, it, if they don't click submit, you don't, it doesn't get kicked down the road for you to grade. Now, I emailed, this is one of those things I said VoiceThread is really good about responding to. I emailed them and said, hey, this is a huge problem. Why isn't there an option where the instructor can just go in and um, force submit any assignments that are open? Um, and uh, the reply, which was very quick, they replied and said, we're working on that. We're trying to create that option, but right now it just doesn't exist. So the good news is that that option is coming, but probably not for the fall. So in the meantime, 
um, this is something to, to say and repeat and underline and make sure um, that students understand the, the importance of that submit button. Um, another pitfall is that any, I guess any lecture format you're going to use, there's a possibility that students will try and um, skim or skip or they'll be half attentive or, you know. Um, students, what I found is that they might try to just read the slides and not also listen to the audio. Um, and, and that could be uh, uh, problematic. Um, if you're in, if, if, well, because in my case, just reading the slides didn't get all of the, the detail. So, um, so knowing that students might do that this coming semester, I'm going to sort of, I'm going to, um, talk with them. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to build in ways to check comprehension of the audio, but I'm also going to really try and impress upon students that they need to do the audio and view the slides um, with full attention. Um, so another pitfall um, is that VoiceThread is not easy to navigate, and I can add on to this that the buttons the, the are sometimes poorly labeled or, or what the label says doesn't really clearly convey what it does. Um, so, so navigation is not easy. Um, on the upside to that, there aren't a whole lot of buttons, so you can't get really lost in it. Um, then uh, another pitfall is instructor and student pages have different layouts as far as I can tell. So they have, students have a lot of the same options. So let me go back to that. Let me go back to. So students have the same kind of comment options that we have. Um, they also will see their peers. Um, from what I can tell, this menu seems to be in a different place. I think it's on the other side of the screen. Um, and I mention that just because uh, um, when students contact me and they can't find something, it's hard for me to say, well, go to this page, look in the top right corner, right, if their screen doesn't look like mine. So, um, so know that. Um, and then lastly, to get um, the most use out of it, they need to use Chrome or Firefox or the app on their phones uh, when they are accessing and, and submitting their voice threads. Um, if they are not using Chrome or Firefox, I think one of the things that happens is the submit button uh, might not be visible to them. So um, they have to use one of those. So some of these things, these are, these are issues but they're issues that if you know they are there you can try and think of ways to build in solutions um, to them so so that they don't become a, a huge problem um, in class okay so sorry i told you that was going to be a lot of me instruction right and um, and, and not a lot of interaction. Um, I, I promise next week interaction um, and will be um, my goal. But um, what questions do you have at this point that um, perhaps I can answer or, or we can answer from our pool of knowledge if I don't know? I think I just need to see a lot of examples. Do you, is the, I mean, you mentioned that it's a good, co it's a company, right? VoiceThread is a company. Is that the name of the company as well as the app? Do they yes. have, do they have a good set of, you know, where can I go and see us, you know, sort of a, a repository of examples? So if you go to, okay. So if you, if you go to this, 
Am I sharing? I'm not sharing, am I? Wait, let me do that right again. Oh, actually, let me just. So I'm going to put I'm going to put the link again in the um, chat. Once you have created your first voice thread and it has created an account, that page will be your home page. So when you go to it, it's going to look. It's going to look like this. You probably you might you might have just one voice thread here and, and not anything there. But when you click here on browse, these are all the voice threads that others have made and made public. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, so you can you can thank you. You're welcome. That was an easy one. Give me another. Hi, Carrie. It's Laura. Thank you Hi. so much for this. Um, I've really learned a lot. My question is, um, are there any accessibility features that VoiceThread has? Yes. Um, they're not easy to deal with. Well, um, so the, um, the, the main issue that is going to come up is that, so VoiceThread takes your PowerPoint slides or, or, or other similar kinds of, of, of media, and it converts those to images, um, which means that if someone is using a screen reader, the screen reader won't read the PowerPoint, right? So, so if that PowerPoint, if I had that PowerPoint um, in its usual format, a screen reader could, prob could read that PowerPoint file, but it can't read the voice thread. So um, for, for those who need visual, as visual assistance, um, there are, um, you have to make sure that the audio basically is going to, is, is covering everything. Right, um, and keep that in mind. For those who need um, who who are who need hearing assistance and can't hear um, the audio, there is not a closed captioning option. Um, the next best option, sorry, there is not an automatic closed captioning option. However, you can upload. Closed a closed a file for closed captioning. The um, the downside to that is um, is that it's not just a simple text file. There's a little bit of um, finagling that has to be. There's a little bit of, of editing that has to be or or formatting that has to be done to turn a text file into a, a file that can be read by closed captioning or converted to closed captioning. Okay, Keith says we're up, we're planning to upgrade the VoiceThread license to include automatic closed captioning. So that solves that problem. Thank you, Keith. Uh, not, not a problem. Uh, that would also include, I mean, if you did have students who did audio or video comments, it would include all of the video and audio, not just yours, but also those of the student comments as well. I'm not sure when that will go through, but that's that's on the docket for us to do. Excellent. Um, I saw another comment up here. Um, so I had a question up here. How did I have to teach students how to use uh, VoiceThread? No, they they took right to it. Um, it, it was very easy for them to navigate and figure out. Um, so that was fine. Okay. I'm scrolling through the comments to see. Um, yes, so, so another question. Can students comment on any slide they want? Yes. Um, 
completely up to them. You can uh, require, um, if you, you can have those like individual slides that say comment here if you want those though. Uh, Carolyn, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, so, and it may be um, for Keith as well. I did listen to the H5P um, training. I went back and looked at that and I do like the functionality that that has in terms of assessing comprehension and, you know, mm. have, so I just wanted to, I guess I'm just trying to decide which way to go <laughs> with the lectures. So you were saying that with the H5P, um, that is mostly with video content. All right. You can, so I would have to first record lectures using, I don't know what exactly, <laughs> um, and then upload them in order to use that, Keith? Yeah. Well, the last uh, workshop I did was specifically for the interactive video activity within H5P. There, there are tons of other H5P activities. So, but if you're just talking about the interactive yeah. video one, yeah, you need to you need to have a video online somewhere. Mm -hmm. So like I would upload an unlisted video to my YouTube account so it's not findable, but I can direct Moodle mm -hmm. to it. Um, and then you with a with the interactive video H5P activity, you basically put a an interactive layer on top of the video. But in terms of having that integrated with like recorded PowerPoint, like VoiceThread, is there? Yeah, so if you wanted to record, do a narrated uh, PowerPoint, you'd have to export that as a video, which you can do, I know, for the, for, from Mac PowerPoint. I'm not sure about Windows PowerPoint. And then you would just upload the, the, the exported video to your YouTube channel. Keep it unlisted if you don't want it public. And then you could wrap interactive uh, video H5P around it. Okay. Or if it's, as, as, as Carrie said, if you've got it up in your YouTube channel, you could bring it into a voice thread slide as well. Okay, so you could do that if you have it somehow already in the YouTube as a video to kind right. of bring it into a voice thread and then have them work together. Yeah. Well, it's either voice thread or interactive video through H5P. You can't really do both of them together. Okay. <laughs> and thank you. And and so Carrie, I guess um after having used this, I was wondering, I you know, I said you said how in the fall you would like to use other methods to assess comprehension. I was wondering if you have thought a bit more about how you might do that if you were just to kind of use this technique again, just to make sure that they're actually doing all of the, you know, listening to the full lecture. Yeah, so one of the things is I'm going, so when we moved in the spring, it was very sudden, of course. So I didn't give, I didn't have the opportunity to give really good instructions for what I was looking for in terms of responses to the voice threads. So this semester, I want to build that into the syllabus and into the you know first days of class when we're onboarding, really talk about what a substantive comment is and response and, and how to en engage in, in that sense uh, with the voice threats. I mean, the technology they get, but, um, but really outlining um, uh, what, what it means to, to respond and engage with them, I think it's going to be really important. The, um, the H5P, which I always wanna call 5HP, but um, uh, is, um, I want to start doing um, one of those and build that in and then another one and build it in um, with other kinds of media. So, so when there's a video that I, that is somebody else already made and I want to use um, and I can pull in uh, from YouTube, that's when I want to go to that. Um, because, uh, you know, sure, I can, I can take a PowerPoint, I can make a PowerPoint into a video, and then I can upload that to YouTube, and then I can make that into the H5P, but that's a lot of upload and download on my part. Um, and I don't think it gives me much more for all of that time investment. So, so I, want, I really wanna um, use that tool for what I think it's going to do best. Um, yeah. Thank you, that's very helpful. You're welcome.
So Moodle forum. So Sarah, you're asking about using a Moodle forum instead of VoiceThread comment to get more control over um, comments. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that doesn't Moodle forum have that option where you can have them, they have to submit first before they can see the other comments and you don't have to moderate it for each um, comment. Um, like you said, you have to do on VoiceThread. So I don't, I just wondered if that was something you considered or use. Yeah, that's, um, that would be interesting. It would be a, a way to do it. I, I found that the more, um, the more applications that students had to run through in one assignment, um, the greater the chance that I would lose them somewhere along the way. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of value to keeping them for one assignment as much within one platform as you can, and then using other platforms for other options. So maybe you wanna do just comprehension questions on the voice thread, and then separately they move to the Moodle forum and ask there you're getting an interpretive or evaluative question that integrates another aspect of learning, right? Um, I, I might prefer to do that um, rather than, um, than, than taking them out of VoiceThread within the same assignment, if that makes sense. Yeah. But it would work, it, it's just, I, I do worry about losing them along the way because it's not just my class, right? They've got four or five other classes that are using different forms of different platforms. And yeah, there's some fatigue involved. Matthew. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, my question is, you know, I learned perusal, perusal social annotating last week learning voice thread this week and then next week what are we doing next week we're just we're doing shared inquiry but it, it it only actually i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna i was gonna say we're only gonna use going to use zoom for that we're going to primarily use zoom um but yeah okay so my question is kind of a bigger question is of all of these applications that you've used I'm not sure I'm going to master two or three or more of them, maybe one integrated. Which one of these do you find, have you found the most effective in your experience? If you were to select just one for the semester, I'm not saying that's what I'm doing, but to, you know, focus. Do we include, on, do we include Zoom? Let's say Zoom is a given. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so if, if Zoom is a given, um, I would, VoiceThread is the one. I, I want to add on. Um, I think I can get the most out of it. Uh, and, and certainly there's a whole lot that you can do with VoiceThread that we didn't even talk about, right? You can have students create their own voice threads and submit them, and then you can have other students comment on those voice threads, right? So, so there's a lot to be done and explored there in terms of what VoiceThread can do. But yeah, you're not going to learn how to use five different platforms at an expert level and your students are, and Keith, you, I don't know, you, you, you might tell me what you think about this, but my experience is that they get, they get some, a little bit of fatigue if you have three, four, five different platforms in one class. Right, you need to worry about student cognitive or overload as, as you were mentioning. And, and it's not just your class, as you said, it, that's, to some extent, that's why we've tried to bring things into Moodle, like VoiceThread into Moodle, perusal into Moodle, so that it's not like I've got my six different uh, Web 2.0 sites that I love and I'm sending my students out there and someone else is sending them out. Uh, at least Moodle can be a home place, but you probably want to, within your course at least, have some consistency from week to week, from topic to topic, so that students aren't getting whiplash as they go through your course uh, from one part of the semester to the next. Which is a relief, right? So you don't, you don't have to master 
a whole bunch of programs. Right. Um, but, and, and I, I think for me, it's which one, so as I'm going through these, which one fits with the way I already do things, right? I don't need to rebuild my whole course around a new platform, but which one is going to help me do what I already do in the best possible right. way. Yeah, as I've worked with faculty in the past, I try to say Moodle or whatever tool you're looking at can do lots of things. Even Word, you know, can do lots of things. You, we all have to decide, you know, what are the things that we want to accomplish? And there are two things. What am I doing now with my class that I want to do more effectively or, or easier? Or, or what can't I do with my class now that a tool could, could let me do? Either, either one of those are valid reasons for bringing on a new tool, but uh, baby steps, right? I mean, take on what you can take on that makes some significant difference now and get good at it and then um, see what remains to be done. Samuel. Uh, yeah, I would just add that one of the things that I am taking away from this presentation, Carrie, is that uh, this is also like a lower data cost for students. And, and especially if you enable a download option, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but they can download the whole voice thread. And then if they're accessing the material on a phone, that is something they can download and watch on a phone or listen to and kind of follow along on a screen. But if it's slides, it is, you know, with big bullet pointed themes, that's easier to view on a small phone versus a, necessarily a laptop. And um, that means that as you're saying, if they're needing to access Wi-Fi intermittently, they can go to a Starbucks or a McDonald's or outside of one, download what they need, and then they can, uh, 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 carry on. Uh, so it's not as data intensive uh, as necessarily a, an interactive video might be. Um, so. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. And I'll say, like many of our students, I operate off of a hotspot um, instead of a um, satellite or hardwired uh, internet provider. So mine is a cellular data plan. Um, and uh, and, and VoiceThread works around that. So, so students, I can say from, from my end, uh, using the same kind of plan that a lot of students are using, it works. It works within the data limits. And um, I don't know, this might not make sense to those of you who don't use hotspot data, but because they have the phone app for VoiceThread, um, they don't have to use, they can use just their main cellular plan, not the hotspot data. Um, so yeah, so it's 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 very workable in in all of those ways, and it's not video, so um, uh, less data involved in that too. All right, any any last questions? I I think I missed a few in the in the chat there. Um, if I missed something, you're always welcome to um, stay a moment or email me. Um, I can, I'm happy to, to jump on at some point and like lead you through again if, if you're um, having trouble or you're stuck on something. Um, and, and Keith is going to post this on uh, the YouTube user channel for TLTC. So you'll be able to, to look at it again later um, and follow along with, with the steps. Um, so yeah thank you so much thank you all thank you all for for coming I, and i i, I hope it went well on your end or it came through well on your end thank you thank you this Carrie. is, is Gaura, and um as you know aviva had to leave uh, early she had to go to another meeting so on behalf of aviva and myself and everybody else who's here i want to thank you for today's workshop and I also want to thank Keith and Marie for co-hosting the workshop with you. Uh, speaking for myself, I'll say I've never had such a steep learning curve or such an easy and enjoyable one. Um, I've learned a lot. I think I'll use a lot of this stuff. And I thank you very much for doing this for us. Thank you.
You're welcome. It's a pleasure. And thank you all for being here. I know we've had a lot of a lot of time on Zoom this summer. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Carrie. Take care. Welcome.